Welcome to Russian History Retold, Episode 126, The Bolovan Rebellion. Piece of music you just heard, we've played before. It's called the Candlelight Trio from Scheherazade by Rimsky-Korsakov. One of the most beautiful pieces of classical music, I think, out there. Last time, we told the story of the rebellion led by the Don Cossack, Stenka Razin. While the rebellion was brutally put down, with many of its members tortured and executed, it did not, as we shall see today, cause the people to stop fighting against the oppressive Russian government. The Bulavan Rebellion is the smallest of the four I will talk about, but surprisingly enough, it could have been the most successful because of the circumstances of the day. If the few seemingly small decisions had been made differently, Peter the Great may have been just another despotic ruler overthrown by his own people. Now, no discussion can be made describing the bolovan led uprising without discussing the reign of Peter I. The son of Tsar Alexis would carry on his father's westernization of Russia in hyperdrive. While Alexis focused on the modernization of the military, Peter took a much broader stroke and went after every conceivable aspect of Russian society. One of the most disliked changes Peter would introduce was the shaving of beards. Many a peasant, especially Cossacks, would rather die than give up his beard. Another group that prized their beards and despised Peter was the Streltsy. Remember way back in episode 26 when the Streltsy revolted and killed a number of Peter's relatives? including his favorite uncle? Well, you can be sure that Peter didn't forget. To him, the Streltsy were a backward band of old believers who were exactly the kind of people who held Russia behind. The Streltsy was also vehemently opposed to the modernization of the military with all the newfangled guns, cannons, and tactics. To the Streltsy, they couldn't understand why all of these progressive changes needed to happen and they felt they were perfectly okay with the way things were. Change definitely frightened them. In 1682, we had the first Streltsy revolt occurring when Peter was a mere boy of ten. Seven years later, another rumored revolt broke out which forced the Tsar to flee to the Trinity Monastery of St. Sergei for protection. The one that caused Peter the greatest concern was the one in 1698, while he was out in the West during his Grand Embassy, where the Streltsy revolted because of word that four regiments based in Moscow were going to be transferred to the fortress of Azov. This they could not stand, for as their life in Moscow was quite comfortable, and they would be forced to work hard in Azov. Forced to return to Moscow ahead of schedule, Peter was in a truly foul mood. He wanted to repay them for the horrors he was forced to watch in 1682 as a boy, and payback, in this case, was a bitch. Peter had over 1,000 of the Streltsy tortured and executed. Bodies of the dead were left hanging throughout Moscow as a warning to anyone else who thought of rebelling against the Tsar. The common folk viewed Peter as a foreigner, influenced by the Germans in his court. They thought that he was against the church, especially when he allowed the last patriarch to die without replacing him. But one other habit of Peter's that really pissed off the populace was his intense need to go to war. Because of this, taxes were always on the rise, and the recruiters were always out in force, taking more and more able-bodied men from the agricultural fields to the battlefields. In 1707, the year of the Bolovan Rebellion, the average peasant paid five times the taxes they did just seven years earlier. Now you think your taxes are going up. Well, one of the reasons for this dramatic increase was the fact that Peter was recruiting massive numbers of men for his army and navy, and that there were 20% fewer people in Russia from 1680 to 1710, according to the census. This meant that the remaining people had to take up the burden for those who died or went into service. As if to thumb his nose at the conservative populace, Peter decided to make another major change in 1700 when he made the following of the Julian calendar the law of the land. Instead of the year being 7207, based on the Russian calendar, 
they were forced to follow the European-based calendar. Just about everyone had a gripe against the Tsar. St. Petersburg, the city built on bones, as they say, was being constructed by tens of thousands of slaves, many of whom died of dysentery or just sheer exhaustion. Add to that the shipbuilding at Voronezh, fortifications at Azov, the naval yard at Taganrog, and you not only have a huge demand for labor, but a massive need for money. Another enormous project was the digging of a canal between the Don and the Volga rivers, which would give Moscow an uninterrupted waterway all the way to Azov. But that was one project that even Peter the Great could not finish. It was only um, completed some 250 years later under Joseph Stalin. He would use slave labor to get the job done as well. Time and time again, disturbances would come up at Taganrog, Voronezh, and other places throughout the realm. This was especially true when the expected pay was late or didn't come at all. Food was oftentimes scarce, which made things even worse. When the governor of Azov called for the recruitment of some 30,000 workers, only half showed up. Such was the dissatisfaction by the people. With all of the foreigners having supervisory jobs over native Russians, we can see yet another issue that was causing the populace to seethe. The people were shell-shocked. As one villager would tell her interrogators, quote, What kind of a czar is he? He has driven the peasants from their homes and taken our husbands as soldiers. He has made orphans of us and of our children and left us to weep forever. What they needed was someone else to be put on the throne. The people had this misconception that a good czar would not bring this kind of terror on his people. Peter was on the side of the evil boyars and foreigners. Rumors began to spread that his half-brother, Ivan Alexeyevich, had not died, but was alive and well in Jerusalem, just waiting for the opportunity to return and take the throne away from Peter. There was also a belief that Ivan was an old believer, and that he would reverse the edicts of Patriarch Nikon and make things right in the world again. This issue of returning the way of the church back to the old times was to be crucial in the recruitment of backers of the last two rebellions, that of Bulavin and Pugachev. This dovetailed nicely into the anti-foreigner sentiment of the people. What many of the peasants had not realized, that the expansion of Russia had caused it to already become a multinational, multi-ethnic, and multi-religious country. But still, the time was ripe for another massive revolt. In Astrahan, the Streltsy were in their last remaining stronghold. As we remember from the previous two podcasts, a preliminary rebellion would foretell the future. The voivoda of the town was ordered to raise taxes on such things like laundries, baths, taverns, and cellars. In July 1705, the Streltsy had had enough, so when they accused the voivoda, Timofey Ryzhevsky, of embezzlement, they rose up, killed Ryzhevsky, and 300 other noblemen, city officials, and foreigners. According to one John Perry, an English engineer who was there, quote, all the strangers that were in the city were cut to pieces in a revengeful manner, without sparing either man, woman, or child. They then decided they would march on Moscow. They believed that the time was right with Peter focused on his battle with the Swedes and Charles the Twelfth. Nearby towns we talked about in the previous podcast on Stenka Razin, Chernay, Yar, and others began to revolt. The Tsar called out the Don Cossack elders to help out. Fearing the same outcome as last time, they decided to help Peter out. In return, they received a special Zolovny the following year for their loyalty. For eight months, the fighting went on until, in March of 1706, Regiments led by Field Marshal Boris Shermietev arrived to squash the rebellion. They were aided by the traditional Cossack enemies, the Kalmyks. While most of the leaders of the revolt were captured and executed, some fled the scene, heading to the Don, where they awaited another opportunity to strike against the government. While the elder Don Cossacks stayed loyal to the monarchy, things were not going well with the relationship. Farming was beginning to creep into the territory, and along with it, slavery. 
Peter, for his part, began to give lands in the northern Don area to his friends, namely the Romanovs, Repnins, and Narishkans. The church also began to expand its monasteries, monasteries southward, as the Tsar took lands away from them in the central part of Russia, near Moscow. The government began to encroach on other long-held Cossack traditions by banning fishing near the captured fort of Azov. They extended this ban to the parts of the Don River, further infuriating the local inhabitants. Then, bans on logging because of Peter's need for lumber for his new fleet of ships also infringed on Cossack business. But the commodity that the government tried to take over and was the tipping point was salt. Salt was one of the most precious commodities in the world at the time, and salt harvesting or mining was traditionally done by the Cossacks in their homeland. The government saw salt as another way to enrich the treasury and would routinely send out army regiments to seize disputed salt holdings. In 1705, a year after the army, led by Colonel Shilovsky, took control of the salt works in Bakhmut on the northern Donetsk, a band of Cossacks, led by their Ataman, Konrati Bulavin, attacked their forces. He and his men were successful in destroying the works, but they were beaten back. Despite losing the fight, Bulavin and his men retreated and began to build up their followers, waiting until 1707 to start up again. The old-time Cossacks were by now greatly concerned with all of the newcomers streaming into the territory, but not enough to turn them over to the Tsar and his people. Peter, for his part, was feeling the drain on the population. He needed to get his projects finished and wars won. In July 1707, he sent Prince Yuri Dolgeroki to the Don along with 300 men to round up the slaves that had fled to the area. If you are wondering, yes, this is a relative to Prince Yuri Dolgeroki who helped squash the Stenkarazin rebellion just 36 years earlier. His job was to track down the, quote, Posad folk and peasants of various landlords who, not wanting to pay their regular taxes, abandoned their work and concealed themselves on the dawn with their wives and children. Making it to the town of Cherkask on September 2, 1707, Dolgeroki met with the Ottoman Maximov, who refused to help the prince in his region, but would aid him in the upper section of the Don and in the northern Donetsk. Within a month, Dolgeruki had rounded up 3,000 peasants. This infuriated one of the upper Don Adaman Cossacks, one Kondrati Afanasievich Bulavin. On October 8, Bulavin and his 200 fellow Cossacks ambushed Dolgeruki, killing him and most of his men. Some of his men, though, escaped to Voronezh, and one, Efrem Petrov, headed to Cherkask to inform the elders. Bulavin wrote a letter to the Tsar explaining his actions. He asked, quote, To recognize the Don and other rivers, as of old, as Cossack territory of our grandfathers, our fathers, and ourselves. Yet with the out the advice or consent of the whole Don host, they went through many settlements, wrecking destruction, and subjecting many men to torture in the knout. They took our wives and daughters to bed by force hung our children by the legs from trees, and without cause slit the nostrils of many Cossacks. Gathering recruits from the local countryside, Bulavin seemed to light the spark of rebellion. Unfortunately for him, the Ataman Maximov attacked them on October 18th and soundly defeated the rebels, with Kondrati just barely escaping. The older Cossack wrote to Moscow, claiming that, quote, the banditry of Kondrat Bulavin has been eradicated, and all is quiet in the Cossack villages. Bulavin, for his part, roamed the countryside in Ukraine, trying to drum up support for a march on Moscow. The Tsar heard this and reached out to the hetman, Mazipa, who was secretly making a deal with Charles XII against the unpopular Peter. Had Mazipa at this time aided Bulavin, it is not beyond the realm of possibility Peter the Great could have been overthrown. Another lost opportunity was Kondrati not approaching the Swedish king. 
But that may or may not have been likely, as Bulavin was not anti-Russian, so he would have had a hard time convincing his men to join the Swedes, but still could have turned the forces and the war completely against Peter. Well, now, with the Tsar embroiled in his fight with Charles, Bulavin appealed to the Don inhabitants to come join the fight against the evil Peter. His message was, quote, to stand with our fervor for the house of the Blessed Virgin, for the true Christian faith, for the pious Tsar, and for our own souls and heads, son with father, brother with brother, comrade with comrade. We shall die as one rather than remain silent and submissive before the wicked deeds of evil men, princes and boyars, profiteers and Germans, who are leading us into the Hellenic faith and away from the true Christian faith. The response to his appeal was staggering, with tens of thousands joining the rebellion in the spring of 1708. One of the leaders, Semyon Drani, proclaimed, quote, Cossack brotherly love and assistance, so that our Cossack rivers should be as before. We are ready to die with you as one, so that Russia might not rule over us, and that our common Cossack glory might prevail. The rebel force was similar to the one that followed Stenka Razin. Peasants, deserters, clerics, and runaway slaves. But there was one very important difference with this revolt. The very fortified towns that jumped at the chance to join Razin were not coming over to Balavin's side, as they were much more comfortable where they were, as Peter had increased the trade between these cities and made the people more affluent. Because of that, Kondrati had to appeal to a new group of adherents, which were the forced labor force who were constricted by Peter's orders to build his navy and work the salt mines. The problem here was with the way Bulavin handled the situation. He attacked the timber works in Koper, killing the director and other minor bosses. The indiscriminate violence, instead of encouraging the laborers to join him, caused them to be revolted by it instead. Another major error occurred in Bulavin's plans when he failed to approach the Bashkirs, who were in revolt at the time as well. Three different allies, who would have given Peter a fight for the throne, all mysteriously left out of the rebellion. The rebel leader, though, had a plan, quote, to march on Cherkask, destroy Azov, and remove from all the towns the boyars, profiteers, and Germans. He also wanted to kill the Ataman because he collaborated with the Azov boyars. Maximov sent an army to face off against Bulavin, and despite outnumbering them three to one, the rebel forces tricked him, attacking after negotiating a peace, which caused many of Maximov's men to defect to the insurgents. With an army, a main army, over 7,000 strong, Bulavin was now a major threat. Given Charles XII was invading Russia, Peter could ill afford to send troops he desperately needed to deal with the rebels. Unfortunately, he had to, as they were heading towards Azov, a city Peter had recently taken and was a major naval port for his military. To deal with the rebellion, Peter assigned the task to guards Major Prince Vladimir Dolgeroki, brother of the slain colonel whom Blavin had killed the previous year. Two divisions of troops were pulled off the Swedish front, along with his prized Preobrazhensky regiment and 400 dragoons from Voronezh. Hetman Mazipa, who was switching sides from Charles to Peter, sent 10,000 Ukrainian Cossacks to help squash Bulavin and his men. Their first encounter with a rebel force of 1,500 was, as expected, a rout. Over 1,000 were killed in the fighting, with few casualties on the side of the government forces. Others were either captured and executed, or they fled the scene. Bulavin was sailing on to Cherkask, which should have been impregnable, except for the betrayal of the Ataman Maximov by some of his men. He, along with a number of other elders, were either drowned or beaten to death, some by Bulavin himself. Hunkering down in Cherkask, Kondrati appealed to the Tsar to leave him alone, claiming that he and his men just wanted to live life quietly, 
like the old days. Internally, many of the house-owning Cossacks were determined to depose Bulavin, who by now was elected as the head Ottoman. Here he decided he wanted to head to Azov and take that citadel. The battle for Azov was a stunning defeat for Bulavin, with hundreds of his men drowning in the river or killed in battle. The others were forced to retreat. This came on the heels of another defeat of an army of 7,000 Cossacks, led by rebel leader Simeon Drani. Well over a thousand were killed in the first day of the battle, along with Drani. The wheels were coming off of the rebellion. The time was ripe for the plotters to kill Bolavin to make their move. The Cossack Shushikov led an attack on Kondrati and his men, which caused Bulavin to barricade himself and his closest friends in a Cossack house. It was attacked by axes and set on fire. A number of men made it into the house, where they found Kondrati Bulavin dead, with a gunshot wound to the head. Some say that he took his own life, but others dispute that account and say he was killed by Shushikov himself. By the middle of July 1708, the whole of the rebellion was under assault by the forces of Peter the Great. Stronghold after stronghold was taken by government forces. On October 3rd, though, they suffered a stunning defeat near Donetsky Godorok, which was revenged by Dolgeroki just a few weeks later. By February 1709, all of the rebel leaders were dead and the rebellion squashed. Peter now decided to take revenge on the inhabitants of the Don and the northern Donets. He had whole villages burned to the ground, and their inhabitants returned to the middle of Russia as slaves. For the Tsar, the end of the rebellion could not have come at a better time, as the Battle of Poltava, where he would crush Charles XII's invasion force, was about to take place on June 27, 1709. He was able to bring his forces back just in time. The Cossacks that had helped Peter, while not suffering as much as the rebels, lost their independence as their Ottoman was no longer elected by the people, but appointed by someone in Moscow. Peter took a large portion of Cossack land for himself, ending the expansion of the Don. Join me next time as we recount the tale of the largest of the four rebellions, the one led in 1773 through 1774 by Yemelyan Ivanovich Pugachev. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. A reminder, I'm blogging on my site, www.russianrulershistory.com, about the dozen seminal moments in Russian history that changed everything. Please visit it when you can and sign up for the updates, or maybe make a donation, big or small, to keep the podcast going. Also, if you have a moment, please rate the podcast on iTunes to help boost its ranking and get more listeners. Join us on Facebook as well, where you can ask a question, leave a message, or make a suggestion. So as always, das vidanya i spasiba bolshoya.